because we know that there's lots of positive impacts food can have on our health and the gut microbiome explains the mediating processes behind that. It's not all it's not all down to the microbiome but a lot of it is and the gut microbiome has a lot of axes it works across the body to improve things like mental health to reduce the risk of things like heart disease and to improve even things like bone health. So understanding how our gut microbiome works and the chemicals it produces can really help us to understand why our diet has such a massive impact on our health overall. I like to talk more about the things that we should do more of because I think that's easier to implement. So certainly having more fibre in your diet and that it means eating more foods like whole grains, legumes, beans, um, vegetables, green leafy, but also mushrooms, aubergines, all of the vegetables, all the plants, nuts and seeds. Add more of those on your plate and make sure you're getting some fibre with every single meal. The majority of us, about 90% of adults in the UK and up to 95% in the US, don't get the minimum, minimum dietary requirement for fibre every day. So we need about 30 grams of fibre per day and we're on average getting 18. So we're really far off the mark. So start with that. Fibre first is a really good way to do it. And then of course, there's other foods that are actually really beneficial as well. Things that are high in polyphenols, things like extra virgin olive oil. We know that our microbes love polyphenols and so having more of those in your diet. And things like omega-3 fatty acids from fatty fish are really beneficial too. And they dampen down inflammatory response, dampen down inflammation that's unnecessary. Then finally, the thing that's emerging and lots of exciting science is fermented foods. So including these in your diet, many countries already do this. Things like sauerkraut, kimchi, kefir, these foods have additional benefits for our gut microbiome and incorporating them every day can have a really beneficial impact on your health. Yeah, I mean, so the main public health messages are based in good science. So I've mentioned them already, but eating more fruits and vegetables, everybody kind of knows that on some level, but it's true and we're not doing enough of it. So the core public health messages are really important. Anyone that flies in the face of those health messages saying that we don't need broccoli, we don't need vegetables, that fiber is bad for us, they're simply lying, but usually to sell you a product or a program or something that they've created. So that's really clear and we need to make sure that the contradictory voices are drowned out by the evidence base because we know that this is more beneficial and this is what people need to eat more of. Um, so I think sometimes starting with the basics is the most helpful thing because most of us aren't getting that right yet. So it's not about individual nutrients. We don't eat individual nutrients or individual foods. We eat a diet, we eat a pattern of foods. And if we can be more aware of what that pattern is, what are the foods you're eating most days? Where can you add more foods that are actually better for you? And then look at that from, instead of focusing on like individual foods, individual nutrients in one meal, what can you see across the whole pattern of your diet? Day to day, but week to week, month to month, and over the entire year, what are the foods you're eating? That can give us a much better insight to your overall dietary quality than just focusing on one element. So I think taking a step back and observing the overall pattern, how often are you eating, what kind of time, what foods are you having more of, what are the things that maybe you could have less of. And I think really starting with making the choices for your home, you can bring food that you want to eat more of into your home. That automatically will push you into eating more of those foods. And, and then there is some, I have to say nowadays, we have to be aware of how many ultra processed foods we're eating. So trying to remove those from your diet where possible. It's almost impossible to have 0%. So it's not about perfection, but if you can get to 80% of the time having foods that are good for you, that 20% is where life happens. It's where you're at the airport and you eat what you can find. It's where you're at the petrol station or where you just need to eat what's available to you. The classification of ultra processed foods is still not widely um, understood or, wide, or easy to actually explain. Now, there's different ways of looking at it. For me, ultra processed foods are always industrially produced convenience foods. So they're always made in a factory. They are always packaged and wrapped colorfully and you know, with lots of marketing messages on them. And crucially, when you look at the ingredients list, you could not make it at home. So there is no way that you have like some of the gums, emulsifiers, sweeteners, the colorants, the different uh, extracts that are used to make these foods. You would not have that in your kitchen. If a food ticks all those boxes, then it is very likely to be an ultra processed food. And again, it's not about perfection, but trying to reduce them where possible. So I'll give you an example. People will go to the supermarket and see 100% natural chicken breast, uh, you know, chicken sticks, the skewers. But actually when you flip the box and look at the ingredients, there are dozens of ingredients on the back. You're much better off buying a chicken breast, slicing it up, skewering it yourself, and putting some spices on it because it's going to be better for you than the ultra processed food version. Now, the difficulty is the marketing can sometimes make it feel like that's actually a whole food. 
And that's where we need to get a bit smarter, read the ingredients label, could you make it at home? Are there things in there that are completely unnecessary? If it's a yes, try not to have it. So I think once we have the basics covered, I think it's really important to ask yourself, where are you in your life stage? And what could work to help you where you are in your life? So as I mentioned, the different ages, and I talk about this a lot in my book, you might have different health outcomes you're aiming for, or there might be different risks that you're contending with. And it's important to understand those and understand how food can help with those. So once the foundation is there, finding out more about where you are in your life, what your goals are, and how you can actually use food as a tool to help you get to that goal, that's where stratification comes in. That's where we can really get to understand what you as an individual need more of at the moment to get you to where you want to be. So certainly in the spaces where we see that food is being marketed to very vulnerable groups, and in that I include uh, children or women who are pregnant or women going through menopause, there's a lot of noise around foods and supplements that could help in that state at those stages. And pretty much all of it is unregulated. So we've got to be much more mindful, much more careful in what we are promoting to these groups to make sure that we're promoting the best possible health for them because it's cr critical time periods and but these are populations that rely on policy and rely on food environment to be there to support them, not hinder them. I hope people reconnect with the power of food as a real ally and tool for them to change their health for the better. I've written about this and much more in my book, Everybody Should Know This, which is available to buy now.